congratulations to these three winners of the 2025 Nobel Prize in Medicine and Physiology for their discoveries related to the regulation of the immune system by T cells. In this video, I'll explain how they won the Nobel Prize and how their discoveries are being used to help people with autoimmune diseases and certain cancers. Please see citations in the notes below, including the links to the publications related to the Nobel Prize. T lymphocytes, or T cells, are part of the immune system important in fighting viruses and other infections. For instance, in this diagram, you can see a virus being engulfed by a macrophage, a type of antigen presenting cell, and then it shows the antigen or piece of a foreign protein to the T cell through the T cell receptor, which then, through a complicated cascade of events, activates the immune system. However, T lymphocytes are essentially generated by random chance in order to recognize the incredible potential repertoire of viruses, bacteria, and fungi out there in the environment. And of course, some of them could unintentionally recognize self-antigens, in other words, to attack your own body and potentially cause autoimmune disease. So there must be some kind of mechanism to cause these cells to not proliferate and attack the body. In other words, there must be some regulation of the immune system. By the way, many of these images are from NobelPrize.org. It's been known for decades that the thymus has an important function of regulation of the immune system. It shows antigens or pieces of the body's own proteins to the T cell receptor. And if the T cell is autoreactive, in other words, it would attack the body's own tissues, it would be eliminated and not circulate throughout the body. The thymus is important for immune system development, but it regresses into fibrotic tissue later on in life. This process is known as central immune tolerance different from peripheral immune tolerance leading to this Nobel Prize. Back in the 1980s, Dr. Shimon Sakaguchi recognized that something other than the thymus was regulating the immune system. When he removed the thymus from three-day-old mice, they developed autoimmune disease. However, he was able to rescue these mice by injecting T cells from other mice, suggesting there was something in the periphery that was helping them with immune system regulation. Further research by Sakaguchi found that specifically a type of helper T cell with a CD25 cell surface protein was required to cause this rescuing from autoimmune disease. So CD4 is a marker for helper T cells, and CD25 is now known as a marker of suppressor T cells or regulatory T cells discovered by Sakaguchi. And a small number of CD8 positive or killer T cells also have the CD25 marker. Rats in the lab without CD25 T cells develop numerous types of autoimmune diseases, thyroiditis, inflammation of the thyroid, gastritis, inflammation of the stomach, insulitis, in other words, inflammation of the insulin secreting cells of the pancreas causing type 1 diabetes, sialoadenitis, inflammation of the salivary glands, adrenalitis, inflammation of the adrenal glands, oophritis, inflammation of the gonads, glomerulonephritis, inflammation of the kidneys, and polyarthritis inflammation of the joints, it would seem that these suppressor T cells have a role in preventing numerous autoimmune diseases. But what are CD25 positive T cells and why do only some helper T cells turn into them? Well, enter the other two winners of the Nobel Prize, Dr. Mary Brunkow and Dr. Fred Ramsdell and their colleagues, of course. They found the protein that starts it all, FOXP3. This protein is a transcription factor, meaning that it binds to and alters the transcription of DNA and decides which proteins are are actually formed in the cell. And when FOXP3 is present, it changes the phenotype of T cells such that they express CD25 and become suppressor T cells. And they genetically engineered male mice that lack the FOXP3 protein, and they die two to four weeks after birth of a disease called scurfy disease. In this disease, helper or CD4 positive T cells proliferate 
invade the organs of the body. In other words, it causes a very extensive and severe autoimmune disease. This gene is present on the X chromosome, which is why male mice tend to develop it because they have only one copy of this gene. And high levels of FOXP3 protein are in the thymus and the spleen. Also, the researchers were able to introduce a FOXP3 transgene, in other words, external gene, back into the mouse eggs and then rescue their sons from developing scurfy disease, proving having a functioning FOXP3 gene prevents this autoimmune disease. And humans have the same gene and there's a human equivalent to scurfy disease. So a disease called IPEX or human X-linked neonatal diabetes mellitus enteropathy and endocrinopathy is caused by mutations in FOXP3 and is usually lethal in infancy. Rare, but real. And they went on to discover other genetic human diseases associated with related proteins, including thyroid agenesis and Axenfeld Rieger anomaly. In a later publication, Sakaguchi was able to take naive T cells, in other words, T cells not expressing CD25, and use a retrovirus to transfer FOXP3 into the cells, and he was able to create a regulatory T cell phenotype very similar to what would occur naturally. In other words, showing the importance of this gene in causing the regulatory T cell pathway to develop. And several other discoveries have been made such that some of the complicated cell biology of suppressor T cells is now understood. So FOXP3 acts as a transcription factor, leading to the development of T cells which have CD25 as a cell surface marker, and this changes the phenotype or activity of the cell. And antigen presenting cells such as a macrophage could present a peptide through the major histocompatibility complex to the T cell receptor and their other related proteins, including CTLA4. And these suppressor T cells could recognize self antigens, and instead of causing inflammation, they would secrete anti inflammatory cytokines or cell signaling proteins such as TGF beta and interleukin 10. And it's also known that mutations in CTLA4 and TGF beta can also also lead to autoimmune diseases. There's a disease called CTLA4 haploinsufficiency, which can mimic other autoimmune diseases and even multiple sclerosis. And abnormalities in CD25 positive T cells have been documented in type 1 diabetes, lupus, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and many other autoimmune diseases. So how is this information used in modern medicine today? Well, I'll show some examples. This is a study in graft versus host disease people with hematologic malignancies, when they get a bone marrow transplant, there's a risk of the graft, the foreign bone marrow attacking the host, the recipient of the transplant. And they tested the introduction of regulatory T cells 30 times 10 to the 5 per kilogram. And you can see the risk of graft versus host disease was lower in those receiving the regulatory T cells versus historical controls, the solid line. This is not a randomized trial. And I admit I'm cherry picking data a little bit here. This is not an established proven treatment. I'm just showing what is possible. There's a drug basiliximab, which is used to prevent kidney transplant rejection. It's a monoclonal antibody against CD25. It doesn't kill suppressor T cells. It blocks the receptors such that the ligand, the protein which binds CD25, which is interleukin-2, cannot bind. Normally, interleukin-2 is a pro-inflammatory cytokine that induces proliferation of T cells. And in this randomized trial, acute rejection occurred in 20.8% of those who received basiliximab versus 34.9% who received placebo for a p-value of 0.05, marginally statistically significant. The ligand of CD25, interleukin-2, is an immunostimulant and has been used as an immunotherapy to treat cancer. This is different from immune checkpoint inhibitors like pembrolizumab, Keytruda. So for instance, this is a randomized trial for neuroblastoma, a rare type of cancer, which was normally treated with isoretinoin, and that's the standard therapy, and we're looking at 
overall survival. So at the beginning, everyone's alive, and this is a survival curve. More and more people die, and you can see the solid line is what happens with the standard therapy. In this trial, some people got immunotherapy, which was a combination of multiple drugs, one of which was proleukin, or aldosleukin, which is interleukin-2, and you can see they did a little bit better with less overall mortality. Some other uses of their discoveries. It turns out the CD25 marker is useful in diagnosis of different diseases. With the test flow cytometry, cells can be sorted and counted based on their cell surface markers, and CD25 is abundant in certain cancers, such as T-cell leukemia and lymphoma associated with HTLV-1 or human T lymphotropic virus. It's also a biomarker of the rare disease HLH or hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. CD25 can also be used to study response to vaccinations. Is there an adequate vaccine response of the immune system? The aforementioned drug proleukin is also used to treat metastatic melanoma, though the data is less robust, mostly based on observational studies rather than a randomized trial. Also, even though interleukin-2, the ligand of CD25, is an immunostimulant, it's thought that lower doses may specifically expand CD25 positive regulatory T cells and could be used for autoimmune diseases and their ongoing clinical trials for atopic dermatitis and autoimmune skin diseases. And perhaps in the future, scientists will find a way to modify suppressor T cells in complex ways treating autoimmune diseases more effectively without weakening the immune system and causing too many side effects. So congratulations again to the winners. This is truly extremely well-deserved, and I have the feeling that in another 10 and 20 years, your discovery will be recognized recognized as even more significant than it is today. Thank you to those who suggested this video and let me know in the notes below if you have other video suggestions and to anyone out there working in the medical research field, you have much more patience and intelligence than me. And remember, even if you have long days in the labs and have to wait months and months to get a single publication, you never know when 20 years later you might come across a Nobel Prize, so keep grinding.